Great. Okay, folks, welcome to the best session of the conference. This is the updates on the data quality, what we've been doing in DHIS2 since we last talked to you last, uh, last year. And as always, we have a lot of new data quality tools. I'll go over those. We have some new data quality approaches. And of course, we have quite a lot of work that's been done in the field and new data quality use cases. Um, so I'm Scott Russ Patrick. I'm the DHIS2 Analytics Product Manager here at the University of Oslo. I'll get, get us started with some of those new features. Then we have our very good friends, Anchu and Bob Pond coming from the WHO. They're gonna give us some updates on the WHO guidance and uh, WHO approaches to data quality, which of course we follow very closely in our tools and, and guidance that we put out as, as DHIS2. And then last but certainly not least, we have uh, Tuzo coming from His Tanzania. Tanzania just went through a massive data quality um, um, review process. And so he's gonna give us some experiences um, and um, share with us uh, that process that they did there, which I think I just went over the program um, in the first slide, so we'll, we'll skip that. All right, on the new data quality features, essentially what we're focusing on right now in core DHIS2 is we have had in the past quite a lot of data quality features. Um, and these features have been spread out over probably about six or seven different applications. Meaning that if you wanted to do kind of comprehensive data quality analysis, you would have to move around as a user between various applications to do different kinds of analyses. And one of those major applications that was that, that is currently used and will continue to be used um, most assuredly is the WHO data quality app. And that's what you see on the left side of the screen there is the WHO data quality app. This was developed a couple of years ago, but it was kind of a radical improvement to DHIS2 data quality functionality when it was released. It included things like year over year charts to look at consistency of data over time, as well as consistency of the data between multiple different variables. It also introduced these scatter plots that help us do kind of outlier detection um, and, and uh, as well as a more advanced outlier analysis um, in the form of kind of pivot tables. And, and WHO and, and University of Oslo in collaboration with all of our his partners, we have been trying to implement or supporting the implementation of this app in as many countries as we can, uh, through academies, through workshops, um, various projects and programs. And it's well implemented now. There's dozens of countries that are using it. Um, we've actually received quite a lot of feedback on it. And one of the main things that we've received on it is this app is incredible. It's introduced a lot of new features and functionalities. It makes data quality checking much better. Uh, it allows us to do more routine data quality checking. So not just like big annual data quality reviews, but like we can look at it every single month and we can allow our users at the lowest level to, to look at it. But the big feedback was we want to have these analytics, these data quality checks directly Scott, on our... Yeah. Scott, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I think you are, you are not in presenter mode. Oh, am I looking at my... Are you looking at the slides with my notes? Well, I can see like the next slide, for instance. So, uh oh, all my secrets. I will try to share my screen again, but I think I am this one. Share better. Alice? Yes, better. Aha, okay. <laughs> so, no worries. Thanks for the um, catching that. So, where was I? We were talking about um, wanting to be able to see the really cool data quality tools and analytics that are in the WHO data quality app on our standard dashboards. Excuse me. And because that's where people are spending the most of their time to do data analysis, that's where they're able to present most of their other data. So all of their service delivery data and all of their um, performance data, all of that is under, under standard dashboards. So of course you wanna see your data quality analytics and tools right alongside your service delivery, your routine data coming from the facilities, right? Uh, you wanna have those side by side and sometimes you wanna quickly move between the two. Um, and that is really 
the, the primary role of the roadmap for the last couple of years really is to start to migrate a lot of these well-known good tools that were dev originally developed in the WHO data quality app into our standard analytics apps um, and, and get those on the dashboard. And I'm very happy to say that we have made a lot of progress on this. And we are now able to show almost all of the data quality tools that are in the WHO data quality app just on a standard dashboard. And I'm gonna demo a couple of those for you, but essentially they are the year over year charts, the scatter plots, which the scatter plots is fresh off the, off the presses, right? I mean, this is brand new stuff. And then we also have a more improved robust outlier analysis on our back end. Um, if I just jump into, oops, just need to get out of my presentation mode here. Sorry, working with too many screens. Okay, let's take a look at DHIS2. All right. So I am, so you see here, I have this scatter plot on my dashboard um, and I am gonna uh, open this in the data visualizer app and just do a quick tour of how this works. All right, so you see here on the, in the data visualizer app, you can define a scatter plot in any which way you want. You can make some really crazy looking scatter plots in DHIS2. There really aren't any limits. In the WHO data quality app, you, the scatter plot format and configuration was kind of hard coded. You weren't, you did not really have a lot of flexibility there. With the with having it in the data visualizer application, you have a huge amount of flexibility. Um, so you have a vertical axis, a horizontal axis. You see right now we have that for the vertical A and C1 visits the horizontal axis A and C, four or more visits. Your points are going to show up as org units. So that's locked to the org unit dimension. And then your filter is periods. In this case, you can add additional dimensions to your filters as well. So if you wanted to see just org units that are community health posts or something like that, you could turn on the facility type, community health posts, add that to your filter. Now in the options tab, if we go to outliers, then this is where you actually turn on the outlier detection. So I'm gonna turn it off just to give you, so here's our normal scatter plot. And then if I go to outliers, then I click on the outliers analysis. I am given three different options. So interquartile, interquartile range, excuse me, IQR, we have Z score and modified Z score. If I click on one of these, you'll see that we have this threshold factor. The threshold factor defines the um, number of standard deviations or in for interquartile range, a number of quartiles away from the average or the median, depending upon the outlier methodology um, to, to, uh, um, to put my threshold lines. Um, and if this doesn't make a lot of sense, that's okay, because I actually have a slide on it because I wanted to take some time to kind of explain it to the community or at least have it recorded exactly why we have these three different methodologies. Sorry, this gets a little bit mathy, but all of us work in data. So uh, hopefully you can stick with me here. So what are we doing? When we do an outlier detection, what we do is we, we draw a linear best fit line. We only have linear best fit lines. We don't have like polynomial or, um, uh, or any kind of uh, other best fit lines. We just have the linear best fit line. So DHS2 will draw a best fit line amongst all of the facilities and um, uh, points that you have on your scatter plot. And then what we do is we measure the distance between the best fit line and each one of the, um, the, 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 the points. Um, in this case, we're looking at facilities, right? And that's, and so you see here, we have like A, B, and C, each one of these is a measurement. And that essentially gives us the data set that we then use to, which is, you know, a, a value, it's a value associated with each one of the points, how far it is away from the, the mean or the median. Um, and then that is the data set that we use to perform our outlier analysis on. So again, we have, sorry for taking us all the way back to um, basic statistics courses, but we have again, three different approaches. We have our interquartile range, our modified Z score and our standard Z score. Now, 
interquartile range and modified Z score are by, are by far the most robust. People have been using Z score for a long time. Um, the difference really is between modified Z score and regular Z score is modified Z score uses the median value. So that, that value that's in the middle of the data set. Um, and as, as, uh, as the, the point at which we, we, we calculate our, um, our standard deviations from. Regular Z score uses the mean or the average. And of course that average is being manipulated by the outliers themselves. So that's why Z-score is not as robust is because the mean, the average is actually being manipulated or influenced by the outliers themselves, uh, which can give you kind of an artificial um, uh, uh, count or an artificial um, uh, calculation of, of the outliers. So interquartile range is maybe one that you guys haven't heard of. It's probably considered the, mo the more robust based upon the statistical experts that we talked to. And we talked to folks from the University of Oslo Statistics Department. We talked to some folks in WHO. We talked to some folks in uh, uh, Norwegian Institute of Statistics. Um, and most of them, I mean, most of the, 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 the statisticians are using something like interquartile range. Interquartile range essentially just divides the data the data set up into four quartiles um, or four pieces. And then it applies these, um, uh, these ranges or these, it blocks off like the first and the third, or sorry, the first and the, the fourth quartile uh, as being acceptable. Or, and then it has anything that's beyond that as an outlier. We can just take a look at this in action. So if I go interquartile range, we have a threshold factor of 1.5. That's considered the standard. You can, of course, increase it or decrease it. If I click update, then it shows this um, scatter plot. You can see that anything that is within those quartiles or that, that threshold is showing up green. Anything that is not is showing up as red. Um, the, then we have a, another functionality that is to show extreme lines. And so what an extreme line is, is we need an indication on this chart, what is the most pressing or what are the worst outliers, right? We see a lot of outliers here, we see a lot of red spots, but some of them are very, very small outliers, relatively speaking to the entire country uh, data. So what are those outliers that are throwing off the national statistics? that if they were not correct, will give an, uh, will manipulate or change the entire national data to be incorrect, right? They're so big, these outliers are so big that they're throwing off the entire national data. And if anyone looks at that national data, they will see the, the data is not accurate. It's significantly not accurate. And so what we're able to do is apply these extreme lines. And these extreme lines will put a line at 1% of the total national figures for both of our variables. So for ANC1 and for ANC4 or more. So if I click update, here you see the extreme lines being applied and anything that is beyond the extreme line above it or past it is an outlier that represents greater than 1% of the national total values. So here, you know, if we look at this one, this one's very simple. So we have this one community health center, right? And their ANC1 visits were 4,681. 4, their ANC4 more visits were just 800, or sorry, 788. So that, that 4,681 is a huge outlier, huge. It's, it's, it's almost twice, it's almost 2% of the entire national figures. Um, and, and so we suspect this to be uh, incorrect data that needs to be followed up. Likewise, if we go way, way over here, we, say, we see that Marie Stopes Clinic has an ANC first visit value of four, 844, and then it has an ANC fourth visit value of 2,095. Again, that's almost 2% of the entire national uh, total of ANC four more visits. So it's, it's a huge outlier. It's probably a, an incorrect value. It needs to be followed up. 
Okay, so that is on scatter plots. Now we have tested this. Right now you're looking at our demo database, which has about 3000 org units or so being displayed here. Um, you see a, there's a lot of clustering here. If I click and drag over an area, I'm actually able to zoom in. So I'm able to you know, see each individual point. At, if I keep zooming in to reset zoom, I can just click up here. Um, and But we have tested this in databases that have up to about 65,000 org units. Uh, it obviously is a little bit slower, but within, you know, it's measured in seconds, not minutes or, or anything. So maybe just a few seconds slower to render than what you saw here. But we, this is a brand new feature. Basically, no one's using it yet. We would love, we can add a lot to this. We can continue to develop this. We can make it much more advanced um, if people need it to be. Um, but as it stands right now, we, it's, it's really quite simple. We would love to get feedback on it. Please tell us what you like, what you don't like, and we are very happy to make any changes based upon your feedback. The last thing that I wanted to, or sorry, the second to last, and I know I'm, I'm a little bit over time actually, but I'll go quickly here, is the year over year line charts. So again, in the WHO data quality app, you saw that we had year over year um, lines, charts, and we've created, we've recreated that in the data visualizer app, but again, with a little bit more flexibility, what was in the WHO data quality app is a little bit hard coded. Um, what you see here, you can turn on any data variable and you can turn on as many years as you want, essentially. So I'm just gonna turn on this year, last year. Um, and I'm going to turn on, uh, let's just turn on, I think we need to turn on months. Okay. Oh, yeah. So that doesn't actually make a lot of sense with this demo database um, because let's turn on 2019 as well. Actually, this data is very close. You can actually see they're kind of piled up on top of each other. Uh, a bad demo, but we see here's 2020, here's 2021. And um, and we're essentially able to do that same kind of year-over-year -year analysis. So if you see the values are, are, are significantly different from year-over-year, -year, especially if you see a spike in one month um, for any of, these, any of these total values, then you can expect, then you know, that's easily to identify as an outlier um, or something anonym, 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 uh, 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 different or in the data that uh, needs to be followed up. Okay. The last thing is in the data quality app. So many countries are using the DHIS2 data quality app, which forgive us for our nomenclature, but it is different than the WHO data quality app. So the data quality app has been around for quite a long time. Uh, not a lot has happened to it in quite a long time, but we have recently updated the outlier detection and the outlier detection is significantly more performant and gives you a little bit more functionality. So I'm gonna turn on outlier detection now. Um, I'm gonna just cho randomly choose some dates. I'm gonna leave my algorithm for, to Z score right now, just for the sake of demonstration. Click start, it's gonna take a minute. Actually, that was very fast. Again, it's much more performant than it used to be. And it does an outlier analysis for me um, that's a little bit more kind of row um, than, than what we saw in the scatter plot, right? So what we saw in the scatter plot is, is very graphical. This is a much more kind of horizontal roll, uh, row orientation to our outlier analysis. And so we see, you know, for each one of the data elements that is in the data set that we selected, we see the data element name, we see where the data, where the org unit is, um, that has the, the problem, we see the value, we see the Z score, the deviation, standard D, mean, min, max. Um, and so we can see that this value 650 is uh, greater than the deviation of 543. So that's why it's showing up here. And we can of course mark it for follow-up. We mark it for follow-up, what that means is that that data value in the aggregate data set is then flagged and you can do something called follow-up analysis 
which will allow the user to go back and check any of these data values later. So it's kind of just flagging it so that you can come back and, and, and review it or push it down or send a message to someone saying, hey, we've marked these values for follow-up. You, you need to check on them. Okay, so again, we really appreciate any feedback or communication around these features. Again, we're making lots and lots of improvements to data quality functionalities in core DHIS2. Um, so any use cases or feedback you have, we would love to hear about it. I am now going to hand it over, stop sharing my screen and hand it over to uh, Ann and Bob, who will take us through the updates from WHO. Over to you guys. Can you, can you share the slide? Or is Bob by Bob going to share the slide? I can do that on... Uh, let me Let's see here. So in the meantime, just a quick introduction. So um, let's turn the camera on for now. Uh, so my name is Ang Chus and I am the um, looking at the the vision of data and analytic and delivery for impacts um, in WHO um, in Geneva. And um, it's very nice to be back and sorry that it's not being in person. It's uh, uh, just it's good to be once, in, once a year to be in this um, community. Um, so just a very quick uh, session today is on some of the latest update on the data quality assurance and data quality review toolkit that has been around the last um, couple of years, uh, but we just do some revisions uh, and put some feedback from the countries and have um, new more materials. And then Bob will give some more detail of one of the most um, it's kind of a significant in terms of the practicality of the tools that has been developed. So um, we also have a, a new sort of, not the new website, but the new link to the website. Um, since the um, WHO website has been uh, restructured, um, and this is a link to the data quality and uh, for all the materials. Um, while you go in there, you will see all the guidance, um, but then for the tools itself, you will need to contact us for that. Next, please. Um, this is just a quick over captures of the work between WHO and uh, the University of Oslo on with the DHI, with the DHIS2 tools. Um, Overall, we have developed several different technical toolkits, and I'm sure most of you here, not all of you are familiar with. Um, one of the key parts, uh, which is the data quality assurance, um, which three years ago, we started to provide the guidance in the framework on the, the meaning of you know, the use of data, uh, how to measure and, and they doing the data quality review. And then later on, it just got evolved for, for others. And that's also the foundation for the data quality apps that, both, uh, that uh, Scott mentioned earlier. Next, please. So what has been the new one? Um, in the past, we have a two models uh, for the data quality review. One is the data quality review that is supposed to be conducted independently um, from, for the, mostly from the cross-cutting HMIS data set. Um, and there is a one features in the DHIS2 um, data quality app, and the other features as a tool is on Excel. And then the second, um, tool is uh, also called a data quality review, but is for the data verifications and the, the system assessment. And that's supposed to be done in the, with the methodologies of a survey um, in the health facility and look at the entire structures in the system for the data, which can influence the data quality. So what is the new uh, feature? The new feature is looking into, apart from, the routine that done externally and sometimes requires a lot of steps and costing. What can be done um, as a as a something that make it into a habit of all the data reports and, and, and data managers, and that's what we call the the routine uh, data quality review or, um, assurance. And this is something that um, we realize it's DHIS two with all the new feature can play a significant impact in. 
changing the the changing the the, the practice of, of data collectors and reports in the facility uh, as well as the data managers of how we can use existing feature to ensure that the data uh, monthly data that is submitted to higher level is completely trusted and accepted by the community. Next, please. This is a quick overview of what's going on. Um, in the past, we, we, we already have a lot of materials. We have the data quality uh, uh, review um, framework. We have the data quality review um, assessment tool. We also have a some of the tools that uh, guidance and facilitator trainings and all of that that you can find in the website. So the two new uh, the two new materials are number one is the data quality desk review. Now it's called the discrete review. That is an implementation guide, and the same implementation guide is also for the module three. So what are in the implementation? Next, please. So what is in the implementation guide for the module two, which is the discrete review? It look at the, the, the content is not much different because we already have the data quality app. Um, we already have the Excel tool. What is needed is to, to, to give a very clear guidance in the training materials for, for those who go to the country or for the country who wanted to, to look at the data quality review um, as recommended, which is supposed to be the end of the year on an annual basis before you're going into the, the national statistic report or you're doing your planning. Um, so it is have a more of a standard approach, which is easier to facilitate the process with partners and with other programs in the field. Currently, this tool is available for the HMIS only. Next, please. Uh, next, please. And then um, this is one of the, the new steps that we were suggested by a lot of partners is to see if we're going to identify the, the data quality review, help to identify all the issues. Uh, but then, then so what? And the data quality improvement plan is a next step that is written down as a guidance to help countries and programs to say, we have these issues, and what you're going to do about that, um, which is to look at all the potential intervention to discuss with different stakeholders um, and, and to agree on a time-wise uh, improvement plan that can be included as a part of the health information system um, action plan of the year of, as a, a, for a longer term will be part of the strategy. Next, please. The very new one that Bob is going to talk about is district data quality assurance, which is, I think it is, I can say that this is making the best out of the new feature that Bob has presented, um, because it uses exclusively at the moment is for the HIS2 um, users, and it, um, it brings a lot of the feature from the data quality app into the, uh, the dashboard, which should be part of the routine data review um, and, and part of the data use. Next. Um, there is the same, the same approach as going to the data verification and system assessment. Um, still, there's a lot of question. We still recommend that it should be, ideally it should be included as part of the health facility data assessment. Uh, this is, it will be costly and it shouldn't be done every year, but, whenever possible between three and five years. And it identify the entire systems that, uh, that would be able to make it into a, a health program um, planning and strategy. And, and this one doesn't um, use the HIS. Um, uh, there is a CS Pro um, software program that has been designed for this use uh, as together with the other modules in the um, health facility data assessment. Next, please. Next book. So, in, no, yeah, implementation. I have to say that we we've been putting these materials out a lot, but we haven't got a lot of feedback. Um, the feedback so far has been the inconvenience of having a data quality app uh, outside, and there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, hence, the improvement in the DHIS two. Um, so 
what we would like to do next uh, is to get more countries implemented and to get the feedback so that we can improve the, the materials. Um, and another features in the Excel tools that we haven't heard of, but there are many countries that have a, that have a both um, DHIS and non-DHIS, and when they do the data quality review, those who don't use DHIS likely have to move into the Excel tools. And, and, and we would like to hear about that as well and see how best whether they put all the data in DHIS or the other way out so that we can identify issues and address the data quality. Next, please. And the next is my, my last slide. Um, there is a plan, uh, we know that there is community, um, the community health information system um, guidance just came out. We have committed to agree to work on the on a, on a guidance to improve or to ensure the data quality of this new um, structure of data collection and reporting, but it also should be linked with the rest of the data system in the country. Uh, there is also very lots of interest, and especially with the funding from the Global Fund TBHIV Malaria, also would like to extend it into their own um, uh, own program specific data quality assurance and, and review um, and malaria has started the work mostly for the for the um, surveillance of data um, the use of the his to a district level that both going to say but i think what also important is not just stay with the district but how it blends in as part of the entire um, national health information system so that the data flow and data quality assurance can be reflected throughout the whole data chain and there won't be a training uh, for, for, for experts who's then going to be able to implement this guideline. And we hope to do that by the end of this year and uh, with the country implementations. So with that, I'm going to end this um, presentation with special thanks to everybody and also with the, the Scott and the team in Oslo uh, for making and aligning different tools together but also with lots of fun and support from Gavi and Global Fund for all the work and the guidance. So I will pass this on to Bob who will go into the district data quality assurance. Thank you. Thank you, An. Let me very quickly introduce the training package, then demonstrate it so that we have time for Tuzo to share the Tanzania experience with the training approach. Uh, this is uh, a uh, training package that can be downloaded from the website that An uh, has in her slide. It is a bottom-up approach to data quality assurance. This slide tries to drive home the point that such data quality assurance needs to be decentralized. That is, it should take place at the level of the district, and it should be routine. It should be every month. Uh, and for various reasons, it's more efficient for data quality issues to be fixed closer to the source rather than through a review at national level. For one reason, the volume of data to review is smaller at the level of the district, especially if the review takes place every month. Uh, the, another reason to do it at the district level is that investigation of the suspicious values is practical for district staff. After all, they should have access to the paper records to make sure there's not a transcription error. And they should have a good relationship with the facility staff and means of contacting them by meetings or phone. And finally, the data belong to the district. So the district are capable, they have the privileges to edit the data and remove the errors. Uh, here's uh, a slide that I'll just point to the bottom uh, bullet, noting that the training approach depends upon the WHO data quality instance of DHIS2, which I'm now going to use to demonstrate to you what I call the 10 minute training. So, uh, let's see.
Uh, the a training approach focuses on use of two tools. One tool is simply a data quality dashboard. The dashboard starts by, are you, are you seeing the, uh, I wanna make sure you're, I've shared the right screen. Are you folks seeing the data quality dashboard? We are. Okay. Uh, the dashboard begins by, with a series of visualizations showing reporting completeness of multiple data sets, uh, a chart that's showing which particular type of health facility is responsible for lower reporting of the malaria data set, a table that allows you to identify in the district the specific health facilities that have lower reporting rates. The dashboard then shifts to reviewing the consistency of the data. Now, you probably are used to seeing this type of a month-to-month -month chart used at national level to identify the very worst of extreme outliers. When a chart like this is viewed at national level, it will not pick up important but smaller outliers that are buried there in the national data set. They're averaged out and you, you can't detect them. But the virtue of doing this kind of review at district level is that you can pick up relatively modest but still important and erroneous values. You see here how the Penta-3 uh, doses have jumped from 585 up to 951. And this is a value which, if all the data were aggregated to national level, would simply not be apparent. So you, you, you see here August 2020, a Penta-3 outlier, and here in March of 2021, a Penta-1 outlier. The data quality dashboard then has a table making use of the DHIS2 predictor rule that actually makes it summarizes all of the important outliers uh, at the district level. Uh, and it identifies the specific health facility. Here you see that it's facility 325, which has reported the outlier in Penta 3. And it's the district hospital itself, which reported that Penta 1 outlier in March of 2021 that we saw. The, tool then shifts to use of the WHO data quality tool, uh, which is available to all of you, even if you don't have the latest features uh, of 2.36, you, you all have access to the WHO data quality tool, which I like to say is like a Swiss army knife of tools for reviewing the consistency of data if this is to be used routinely and uh, used quickly, we need to somehow simplify the use of the tool. And uh, for purposes of routine data quality assurance at district level, we like to in particular jump right to using the outlier tool, which I, I compared to the magnifying lens and the tweezers of the Swiss Army knife. To use this for a district review, We've defined a special set of indicators for the district that we particularly want to focus on. And to, to do the review for a particular district, we're, we will set the organization unit to District A1. Of course, this would be done automatically if, when the district staff logged on, but this is a national instance. So if we jump to the outlier tool, Rather than playing around with drilling down and training the district staff how to drill down, there's no need to do it when the tool is used at district level. And they should begin by simply filtering for values that have a modified Z-score that are extreme. And when they do that, they are automatically taken to uh, a rather short list of values that need review that month. And you see that the tool has picked up, again, this outlier in Penta 3 from August of 2020, and it's picked up the outlier that we saw in Penta 1 values uh, 
So the, the outlier tool has come up with a rather modest set of tasks for the district staff to uh, attend to. Uh, something that is fr frequently overlooked with this outlier tool is that it also allows you to identify important missing values. So if we, on the options, filter uh, for missing data, turning the outlier filter off, we are taken right to some of the values that are uh, most important in, in uh, missing. And in this case, you see right at the top, the district hospital has failed to report its, its outpatient form for three months of the last 12. It is useful at district level to be able to do some aspects of review offline. And for that, the best thing to do is to click on the download button. And uh, that will generate a CSV file that, that includes all the data in the outlier tab. Now what I have to do is, uh, is a new share. Uh, so here's the CSV file that's downloaded. And as with any, uh, let me see if I can, as with any uh, Excel or CSV file, you can then use the sorting function to uh, uh, sort it, in this case, according to the modified Z-score, largest to smallest. And it will, again, identify the, uh, it will, again, uh, ident identify those particular indicators and facilities which have the, uh, the, the most important outliers. Of course, the Excel tool doesn't like the outlier tab uh, highlight in red. So you've got to go, to, go through and, uh, and circle these or, or highlight them. Uh, but you can print this out and then take it for supervision or have it there on your desk for, for later reference. So in summary, that's what I refer to as the 10 minute training. And uh, the essential aspect is to identify the, the most efficient uh, tools in the DHIS2 toolbox, uh, the ones in which you can train district staff in a small number of minutes uh, to undertake it. Uh, what I would like to do now is hand over to Tuzo, if I can uh, do that, uh, and ask him to uh, share with us the experience from a training workshop in Tanzania with this district data quality assurance approach. Tuzo? <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh, I think you have a slide. Can you please share? Yes, uh, Thank indeed. You. Let me get back to. Uh... Okay. Uh, hello, all. Uh, while we are waiting, uh, Bob, to share the the slide. Can I actually introduce myself? Uh, my name is Tuzo Englebet, actually working under uh, East Tanzania and uh, are providing support uh, to the Ministry of Health, uh, who uh, actually use heavily the DHS2 platform in different, uh, in different uh, projects. And uh, uh, the data quality uh, assurance that uh, my colleague has already presented. Uh, it's, uh, we actually configured it in uh, our DHS2, uh, Minister of Health, uh, Bob uh, from the consultant of WHO, actually collaborated together to make everything works. And uh, actually uh, the configuration uh, uh, involved the use of uh, predictor to identify the extreme outlier and the bob was showing up in the demo. Actually, the, to the same configuration that we did in our uh, in our DHS2 instance in HMS Tanzania, 
uh, but also that has to go with the creation of the data quality dashboard that the one uh, like Bob showed you. And uh, after that, uh, we had to create the training material because after we've configured all of them in the HMS Tanzania, uh, we actually need to create the training material where we'll be able to capacitate uh, the CHMT at the council level. Uh, although it was not all the council, but we selected a few of them uh, so that we can uh, capacitate them how to use those data quality uh, dashboard with the WHO dash data quality tool. And then it can be scaled out uh, to other uh, to other uh, to other council. Next, next, yeah. As uh, Bob was showing, actually, it was the same thing. Uh, we had different dashboards uh, that was configured in the HMS in Tanzania, as you can see. One was kind of checking the reporting rates of several forms uh, because uh, in the, our database is, is huge and we have a lot of data set. So we had to pick those uh, forms that uh, mostly use it. And then so that we can configure uh, the, the, the data quality dashboard. And then as you can see, there are several uh, dashboards that was configured. Uh, even that included the other program like HIV, and, and, and the other. And the, on another side, that was the uh, WHO data quality tool that we configured, uh, aim being uh, to identify those extreme outlier uh, within, the, uh, within uh, the variables. So, and essentially uh, the use of that uh, because is that, uh, go next. Next again. Yeah, uh, the use of that, that's it. Uh, the use of that is that, uh, uh, we have a public portal also uh, where at after every three months or after every quarter we have to means they have to upload the data so we have to make sure that the data are of good quality so one of the things is was to create something that can help them even at the council level uh, before even sitting uh, doing the data quality review the quarterly data quality review most of them being cleared out by the uh, council uh, staff the chmt who has direct access to the to the facility so one of the tool was to create this dashboard uh, by using the predictors so that uh, those uh, external trial can be alerted and then the chmt can see those outliers and then uh, contact direct to the facility for uh, for rectification. Uh, for example you can see one of the table you find, you might find that uh, some of the facility was reporting this huge amount of, of data which somehow it's uh, maybe due to error uh, maybe uh, which is somehow impractical to have this kind of uh, visit to that is to the specific uh, health center that is the like a medium facility so we expect maybe this large large number of uh, visit to be in a uh, hospitals, regional hospital, and even in, in referral. But for medium facilities, we don't expect to have this huge number of visits uh, within a given uh, one period of work. So this one was to help them to uh, identify the extreme outlier. And the thing was not just to, uh, to, to get the visualization, the dashboard, but we also configured to send an email having those extreme, extreme outliers. Next. Yeah, another thing was to uh, kind of uh, use the WHO data quality tool. So this also was uh, being part of the training manual uh, that was being designed uh, to help them to identify those extreme, uh, extreme outliers. As you can see, uh, you might find that uh, those I, I, I just pulled out uh, to see the extreme outlier from out of 26 region. But you may find that there are few only uh, facilities, a uh, few regions which uh, st still have this extreme ultra, which means most of them has been, uh, has been cleared. Next. So there are several challenges that we observed uh, while uh, doing this training and the configuring, uh, configuring uh, this WHO data quality. Uh, one of the the challenge that we observed is that, uh, you know, we have this tendency of changing the, the tools that used uh, for reporting. 
So this actually affects uh, the configuration that has been done because uh, you need again to reconfigure applying these new variable that has been uh, changed in the form. So that was one of the, uh, the problem that we face it, that you have already configured the dashboard and then you find out that uh, the MOH, uh, the Minister of Health is changing the reporting tool, so you might need to, to reconfigure. Uh, but again, uh, we capacitated a few SHMT uh, for selected council, but uh, we have a one and uh, at 70 councils, so it was somehow impossible to capacitate all of them. So what we did is just to select a few of them and conduct like a TOT so that they can uh, scale up to, uh, to, other, uh, uh, to other staffs. Also lack of fund, uh, which lead to somehow, uh, not all of them that conduct monthly data review, uh, some decide to conduct uh, quarterly data review, some even do once per year. So, you might find that uh, uh, doing the cleaning uh, is somehow positive because you might find that the same staff who are doing other activities uh, have also to conduct this monthly data review. So at least having the dashboard uh, could, uh, looking for the intensity of the data has to somehow fall on them and then and those emails that we are sending to him helps them also to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to kind of uh, follow up on the data quality issue. Uh, but during our training to a uh, few facilities, to few uh, councils, uh, some of course uh, explained if we can somehow uh, include the functionality when you are using the WHO data quality and exporting the data, the data has to come with the data. I think Bob has showed you, uh, you need to kind of have kind of sort because they want it to that is somehow sim simple to use. You download and it comes with the uh, with the color for those extra trials so that they can carry uh, it to maybe to the uh, person that is responsible for the rectification. Uh, but also, uh, you know, this data quality makes sense when you are actually uh, doing it at the facility level. So comparing to our uh, our database, which have almost eight thousand facilities, it is somehow impossible to do it at the national. So you have to do it one maybe cancel at a time because it will take some time to load. So you just somehow uh, uh, emphasize that at region or maybe they can do it a faci one facility at, it, at a time. Next. I think that's marked the end of my, my presentation. So I welcome if you have any issue or concern. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tuzo. It's really, really great presentation and, and really incredible to see a country actually adopting all of the various tools and, and guidance that we, that we have been con developing globally um, very quickly. And I think it's a good testament to say that all of these all of these tools, the, these guides that Ann and Bob are talking about, these functionalities that I was presenting, these are not theoretical. You can use these, they work, uh, and you can make significantly significant strides in addressing your country's data quality issues. All of that being said, in the chat, we have been sharing uh, resources, materials for you. Um, you know, virtually every country is struggling with data quality. Uh, virtually uh, every country is, is asking for some kind of guidance there. And we are compiling as much of it as we possibly can. Uh, we are making as much of it as publicly available as we possibly can. So there's two links in the chat there. I just kind of want to draw your attention towards. The first one is um, Nora Stoops was asking for guidance or an example of a country that has good standard operating procedures for actually fixing data quality mistakes they find. It's one thing to find it. It's something entirely different to actually change the value, fix it, get it you know, verified and approved. Um, and probably the best one that we know of right now is Rwanda. And Rwanda has an extremely robust data quality standard operating procedures. And Shurajit, I see in the chat has shared that. So please take a look at that. Um, if you want a, an example of a country that's, that's really kind of uh, a best practice when it comes to standard operating procedures to actually fixing data quality mistakes. The other things I wanna point your attention to is that we have now posted all of the Data Quality Academy videos online. Uh, we have a week-long Data Quality Academy. 
lots of sessions. We go over in detail everything that you've just seen here and a whole lot more. All of those videos to all of the sessions are available on our YouTube uh, channel. So please take a look at that. Uh, you can see lots of use cases there as well. Uh, just a, a tremendous amount of information. I also then posted a quick configuration guide. Tuzo was mentioning how they have used predictors and automated messages to start to um, auto kind of automatically detect outliers and send those messages to the people who can do something about it. There is a guide here, uh, Word document, quite short, uh, step by step, how to actually configure that in DHIS2. The last thing that I wanted to point out is that we are also trying to make our Data Quality Academy completely self-guided, meaning you don't have to listen, you know, all of the lectures are pre-recorded, the exercises are pre-recorded, and you can go through it at your own time, at your own pace, whenever you want. And I believe that, that we are getting very close to being able to publish that if we haven't already. I don't know, Shurjit, if you uh, have any updates on that, but... Um, but uh, but hopefully in the very near future, if not already, we will have the entire online Data Quality Academy. Uh, so self-paced course, so you can go through that at any time. Uh, all of that, again, being said, I think the important principle here is do not suffer in silence. There is a whole world of, of countries struggling with this, working together on this. Uh, please do reach out to us in the community practice. You can send me an email directly, scott at dhis2.org. If you need any guidance, you need any information. Uh, if I'm not able to answer your question, there are certainly someone that we know in our network who can. Uh, so, so please do um, reach out, get as much information as you can. And uh, if you run into any problems with any of the functionality or implementing anything in DHIS2, again, let us know. Um, we have just a couple of minutes for any questions. I think we've been answering questions in the chat as they have come in. Um, any questions? I don't see anything on the community practice either. Um, Nora, I feel like I should give you an honorary moment to say something. If you want, Nora Stoops, who uh, from his South Africa has been leading the charge in data quality in many countries as well. Um, Scott, thank you. Can, oh yes, you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, it's a, data quality is both a good news and a bad news situation. It's a good news that people are looking at it. It's not such a good news because we find that so often the data doesn't get corrected and that's a big issue. And I'm very really grateful for pointing out the, um, that Rwanda has a SOP. And and I think that that's, uh, that's real good progress. Uh, yeah, all I can say about data quality is a luta continua. Oh, yes. Scott, I don't know if you mentioned, but I noticed in a few countries, DHAs to instances that the data entry clocks do not have access to the data quality app, which means they can run the data uh, validation in the data entry form, but they cannot go outside once they've collected for the facility or for the district and run it for a whole district. And that I think is something that I was oblivious to until recently. And it's, I think it's something that countries need to look at and make sure. Right, yeah, thanks a lot, Nora. Uh, yeah, some really, some really like basic steps to improving data quality is make sure your users can actually use the functionalities that identify the data quality issues. Uh, seems obvious, but it is it is a big stumbling block for, for a lot of folks. I see Surajit just posted in the chat that we are just putting some finishing touches on the self-paced data quality course uh, and, that, and that they on the training team will keep the community posted. A tremendous effort on their part to try to get uh, that self-paced course up and, and live. And once we do, again, you'll be able to go through all of the DHIS2 um, functionalities, all of the trainings, that all, uh, um, all of the exercises that we have um, on data quality at your own time, at your own pace. Um, and, and there won't be any reason why anyone can't be trained on DHIS2 data quality. And again, all of the data quality materials that we develop follow very closely the, the, go, the WHO guidelines and principles that Ann and Bob were, were sharing. I think that wraps it up for the data quality course.